Chapter 23 We had lunch, a simple Greek meal of goat's milk cheese and green pepper salad with eggs under the colonnade. The cicadas rasped in the surrounding pines, the heat hammered down outside the cool arches. I had, on the way back, made one more effort to penetrate the situation by trying, too casually, to get him to talk about Le Verrier. He had hesitated, then glanced at me with a gravity that did not quite hide the smile behind it. Is this how they teach you at Oxford now? One reads last chapters first, and I had had to smile and look down. If his answer had not quenched my curiosity at all, it had at least jumped another pretense and moved us on. In some obscure way, one I was to become very familiar with, it flattered me. I was too intelligent not to be already grasping the rules of the game we played. It was no good my knowing that old men have conned young ones like that ever since time began. I still fell for it, as one still falls for the oldest literary devices in the right hands and contexts. All through the lunch we talked of the undersea world. For him it was like a gigantic acrostic, an alchemist's shop where each object had a mysterious value, an inner history that had to be deduced, unraveled, guessed at. He made natural history sound and feel like something central and poetic, not an activity for scoutmasters and a butt for punch jokes. The meal ended and he stood up. He was going upstairs for his siesta. We would meet again at tea. What will you do? I opened the old copy of Time magazine I had beside me, tucked carefully inside lay his 17th century pamphlet. You have not read it yet? He seemed surprised. I intend to now. Good, it is rare. He raised his hand and went in. I crossed the gravel and started idly off through the trees to the east. The ground rose slightly, then dipped. After a hundred yards or so, a shallow outcrop of rocks hid the house. Before me lay a deep gully choked with oleanders and thorny scrub, which descended precipitously down to the private beach. I sat back against a pine stem and became lost in the pamphlet. It contained the posthumous confessions and letters and prayers of a Robert Foulkes, vicar of Stanton Lacey in Shropshire. Although a scholar and married with two sons, in 1677 he had got a young girl with child and then murdered the child, for which he was condemned to death. He wrote the fine, muscular, pre-Dryden English of the mid-17th century, he had mounted to the top of impiety, even though he had known that the minister is the people's looking-glass. Crush the cockatrice, he groaned from his death cell. I am dead in law. But of the girl he denied that he had attempted to vitiate her at nine years old. For upon the word of a dying man, both her eyes did see, and her hands did act in all that was done. The pamphlet was some forty pages long, and it took me half an hour to read. I skipped the prayers, but it was, as Conchise had said, more real than any historical novel, more moving, more evocative, more human. I lay back and stared up through the intricate branches into the sky. It seemed strange to have that old pamphlet by me, the tiny piece of a long-past England that had found its way to this Greek island these pine trees, this pagan earth. I closed my eyes and watched the sheets of warm color that came as I relaxed or increased the tension of the lids. Then I slept. When I woke, I looked at my watch without raising my head. Half an hour had passed. After a few minutes more of dozing, I sat up. He was there, standing in the dark, ink-green shadow under a dense carob tree, seventy or eighty yards away, on the other side of the gully, at the same level as myself. I got to my feet, not knowing whether to call out, to applaud, to be frightened, to laugh, too astounded to do anything but stand and stare. The man was costumed completely in black, in a high-crowned hat, a cloak, a kind of skirted dress, black stockings. He had long hair, a square collar of white lace at the neck, and two white bands, black shoes with pewter buckles. He stood there in the shadows, posed, 
of Rembrandt, disturbingly authentic and yet enormously out of place, a heavy, solemn man with a reddish face, Robert Foulkes. I looked round, half expecting to see Conchy somewhere behind me, but there was no one. I looked back at the figure which had not moved, which continued to stare at me from the shade through the sunlight over the gully, and then another figure appeared from behind the carob. It was a white-faced young girl of fourteen or so, in a long, dark brown dress. I could make out a sort of close-fitting purple cap on the back of her head. Her hair was long. She came beside him, and she also stared at me. She was much shorter than he was, barely to his ribs. We must have stood, the three of us, staring at each other for nearly half a minute. Then I raised my arm with a smile on my face. There was no response. I moved ten yards or so forward, out into the sunlight, as far as I could, to the edge of the gully. "'Good day,' I called in Greek. "'What are you doing?' And then again, "'Ticanete?' But they made not the least reply. They stood and stared at me. They stood and stared at me, the man with a vague anger, it seemed, the girl expressionlessly. A flaw of the sun-wind blew a brown banner, some part of the back of her dress, out sideways. I thought, it's Henry James. The old man's discovered that the screw could take another turn, and then his breathtaking impudence. I remembered the convention about the novel. Words are for facts, not fiction. I looked round again toward the house. Conscious must declare himself now, but he did not. There was myself, with an increasingly foolish smile on my face, and there were the two in their green shadow. The girl moved a little closer to the man, who put his hand ponderously, patriarchally, on her near shoulder. They seemed to be waiting for me to do something. Words were no use. I had to go close to them. I looked up the gully. It was uncrossable for at least a hundred yards. But then my side appeared to slope more easily to its floor. Making a gesture of explanation, I started up the hill. I looked back again and again at the silent pair under the tree. They turned and watched me until a shoulder on their side of the small ravine hid them from view. I broke into a run. The gully was finally negotiable, though it was a tough scramble up the far side through some disagreeably sharp-thorned smilax. Once through that I was able to run again. The carob came into sight below. There was nothing there. In a few seconds, it had been perhaps a minute in all since I had lost sight of them, I was standing under the tree on an, unre on an unrevealing carpet of shriveled carrots. I looked to where I had slept. The small gray and red-edged squares of the pamphlet and time lay on the pale carpet of needles. I went well beyond the carob until I came to strands of wire running through the trees at the edge of the Gindland Bluff, the eastern limit of Barani. The three cottages lay innocently below in their little orchard of olives. In a kind of panic, I walked back to the carob and along the east side of the gully to the top of the cliff that overlooked the private beach. There was more scrub there, but not enough for anyone to hide, unless they lay flat, and I could not imagine that choleric-looking man lying down flat, in hiding. Then from the house I heard the bell. It rang three times. I looked at my watch. Tea time. The bell rang again. Quick, quick, slow and I realized it was sounding the syllables of my name. I ought, I suppose, to have felt frightened, but I wasn't. Apart from anything else, I was too intrigued and too bewildered. Both the man and the whey-faced girl had looked remarkably English, and whatever nationality they really were, I knew they didn't live on the island. So I had to presume that they had been specially brought, had been standing by, hiding somewhere, waiting for me to read the folk's pamphlet. I made it easy by falling asleep, and at the edge of the gully. But that had been pure chance. And how could Conchis have such people standing by? And where had they disappeared to? For a few moments I had let my mind plunge into darkness, 
into a world where the experience of all my life was disproved and ghosts existed. But there was something far too unalloyedly physical about all these supposedly psychic experiences. Besides, apparitions obviously carry least conviction in bright daylight. It was almost as if I was intended to see that they were not really supernatural, and there was Contreras' cryptic doubt-sowing advice that it would be easier if I pretended to believe. Why easier? More sophisticated, more polite, perhaps, but easier suggested that I had to pass through some ordeal. I stood there in the trees, absolutely at a loss, and then smiled. I had somehow landed myself in the center of an extraordinary old man's fantasies. That was clear. Why should he hold them? Why he should so strangely realize them? And above all, why he should have chosen me to be his solitary audience of one remained a total mystery. But I knew I had become involved in something too uniquely bizarre to miss or to spoil through lack of patience or humor. I recrossed the gully and picked up time and the pamphlet. Then, as I looked back at the dark, inscrutable carob tree, I did feel a faint touch of fear. But it was a fear of the inexplicable, the unknown, not of the supernatural. As I walked across the gravel to the colonnade, where I could see Conchis was already sitting, his back to me, I decided on a course of action, or rather, of reaction. He turned. A good siesta? Yes, thank you. You have read the pamphlet? You're right. It is more fascinating than any historical novel. He kept a face impeccably proof to my ironic undertone. Thank you very much. I put the pamphlet on the table. Calmly in my silence, he began to pour me tea. He had already had his own and went away to play the harpsichord for twenty minutes. As I listened to him, I thought. The incident seemed designed to deceive all the senses. Last night's had covered smell and hearing. This afternoon's and that glimpsed figure of yesterday, sight. Taste seemed irrelevant. But touch? How on earth could he expect me even to pretend to believe that what I might touch was psychic? And then what on earth, appropriately on earth, had these tricks to do with traveling to other worlds. Only one thing was clear. His anxiety about how much I might have heard from Bitford and the Verrier was now explained. He had practiced his strange illusionisms on them and sworn them to secrecy. When he came out, he took me off to water his vegetables. The water had to be drawn up out of one of a battery of long-necked cisterns behind the cottage. And when we had done that, and fed the plants, we sat on a seat by the Priapus arbor, with the unusual smell, in summer grease, of verdant, wet earth all around us. He did his deep-breathing exercises, evidently, like so much else in his life, ritual, then smiled at me, and jumped back twenty-four hours. Now, tell me about this girl. It was a command, not a question, or a refusal to believe I could refuse again. There's nothing really to tell. She turned you down. No, or not at the beginning. I turned her down. And now you wish? It's all over. It's all too late. You sound like Adonis. Have you been gored? There was a silence. I took the step, something that had nagged me ever since I had discovered he had studied medicine, and also its shock and also to shock his mocking of my fatalism. As a matter of fact, I have, he looked sharply at me, by syphilis. I managed to get it early this year in Athens. Still, he observed me. It's all right, I think I'm cured. Who diagnosed it? The man in the village, Pantorescu. Tell me the symptoms. The clinic in Athens confirmed his diagnosis, no doubt. His voice was dry, so dry that my mind leapt to what he hinted at. Now tell me the symptoms. In the end, he got them out of me in every detail. As I thought, you had soft sore. 
soft sore, chancroid, ulcus mole, a very common disease in the Mediterranean, unpleasant but harmless. The best cure is frequent soap and water. Then why the hell, he rubbed his thumb and forefinger together in the ubiquitous Greek gesture for money, for money and corruption. You have paid? Yes, for this special penicillin. You can do nothing. I can damn well sue the clinic. You have no proof that you did not have syphilis. You mean Paterescu? I mean nothing. He acted with perfect medical correctness. A test is always advisable. It was almost as if he were on their side. He shrugged gently. Thus the world goes. He could have warned me. Perhaps he considered it more important to warn you against venery than venality. In me battled a flood of relief at being reprieved and anger at such vile deception. After a moment, Conchie spoke again. Even if it had been syphilis, why would you not return to this girl you love? Really, it's too complicated. Then it is usual. Not unusual. Slowly, disconnectedly, prompted by him, I told him a bit about Allison, remembering his frankness the night before, produced some of my own. Once again, I felt no real sympathy coming from him, simply his obsessive and inexplicable curiosity. I told him I had recently written a letter. And if she does not answer? I shrugged. She doesn't. You think of her, you want to see her, you must write again. I smiled then briefly at his energy. You were leaving it to hazard. We no more have to leave everything to hazard than we have to drown in the sea. He shook my shoulder. Swim? It's not the swimming. It's knowing in which direction. Toward the girl. She sees through you, you say. She understands you. That is good. I was silent. A primrose and black butterfly. A swallowtail hovered over the bougainvillea round the Priapus arbor, found no honey, and glided away through the trees. I scuffed the gravel. I suppose I don't know what love is, really, if it isn't all sex, and I don't even really care a damn any more, anyway. My dear young man, you are a disaster, so defeated, so pessimistic. I was rather ambitious once. I ought to have been blind as well. Then perhaps I wouldn't feel defeated. I looked at him. It's not all me. It's in the age. In all my generation. We all feel the same. In the greatest age of enlightenment, in the history of this earth, when we have destroyed more darkness in this last fifty years than in the last five million. As at Neuve Chapelle, Hiroshima. But you and I, we live. We are this wonderful age. We are not destroyed. We did not even destroy. No man is an island. Ha! Rubbish. Every one of us is an island. If it were not so, we should go mad at once. Between these islands are ships, aeroplanes, telephones, wireless, what you will, but they remain islands. Islands that can sink or disappear forever. You are an island that has not sunk. You cannot be such a pessimist. It is not possible. It seems possible. Come with me. He stood up, as if time was vital. Come. I will show you the innermost secret of life. Come. He walked quickly round to the colonnade. I followed him upstairs. Then he pushed me out onto the terrace. Go and sit at the table, with your back to the sun. In a minute he appeared, carrying something heavy draped in a white towel. He put it carefully on the center of the table. Then he paused, made sure I was looking, before gravely he removed the cloth. It was a stone head. It was a stone head. Whether of a man or a woman, it was difficult to say. The nose had been broken short. The hair was done in a fillet, with two side pieces. But the power of the fragment was in the face. It was set in a triumphant smile. A smile that would have been smug if it had not been so full of the purest metaphysical good humor. The eyes were faintly oriental, long, and as I saw, for Conchise put a hand over the mouth, 
also smiling. The mouth was beautifully modeled, timelessly intelligent, and timelessly amused. That is the truth, not the hammer and sickle, not the stars and stripes, not the cross, not the sun, not gold, not yin and yang, but the smile. It's cycladic, isn't it? Never mind what it is. Look at it. Look into its eyes. He was right. The little sunlit thing had some Newman, or not so much a divinity as a having known divinity in it, of being ultimately certain. But as I looked, I began to feel something else. There's something implacable in that smile. Implacable? He came behind my chair and looked down over my head. It is the truth. Truth is implacable. But the nature and meaning of this truth is not. Tell me where it came from. From Didyma in Asia Minor? How old is it? The 6th or 7th century before Christ. I wonder if it would have that smile if it knew of Belson. Because they died, we know we still live. Because a star explodes and a thousand worlds like ours die, we know this world is. That is the smile. That what might not be is. Then he said, When I die, I shall have this by my bedside. It is the last human face I want to see. The little head watched our watching, bland, certain, and almost maliciously inscrutable. It flashed on me that it was also the smile that Conchi sometimes wore, as if he sat before the head and practiced it. At the same time, I realized exactly what I disliked about it. It was above all the smile of dramatic irony of those who have privileged information. I looked back up at Conchis' face, and I knew I was right.